One of the most shocking chapters in this saga is the brutal execution of Egyptian King Ramses. Despite being one of the greatest pharaohs in Egyptian history, his reign was marked by conflict and turmoil, and his death was a testament to the brutal nature of ancient politics. In this video, we will explore the circumstances surrounding Ramses' execution, shedding light on a dark and little-known chapter in the history of ancient Egypt. Ramses III was the ancient Egyptian king who reigned from 1187 through 1156 BCE who successfully defended Egypt against foreign invasion in three major wars. However, he experienced internal difficulties in his later years and was finally assassinated in a failed coup d'etat. The 20th dynasty from 1190 to 1075 BCE was founded by Ramses' father, Seknacht, who reigned from 1190 through 1187 BCE, and upon Ramses' arrival, Egypt had only just begun to stabilize after the political turmoil that had marked the conclusion of the 19th dynasty. The western Nile River Delta was invaded by a coalition of Libyan tribes in the fifth year of his reign over accusations that the pharaoh had meddled in the succession of their ruler. As had been the case often throughout the 19th and 20th dynasties, Libyans had invaded Egyptian territory, but they were decisively destroyed in a fight in the western delta. After two years of relative calm, another more menacing coalition, the Sea People, a collection of migrants from Asia Minor and the Mediterranean Islands, attacked Egypt from both land and sea. These people were responsible for the destruction of the Great Hittite Kingdom in Asia Minor and the devastation of Syria. Ramses' land force halted the aggressors in southern Palestine while the enemy fleet was caught in the Delta's canals. Despite Egypt's success in warding off the northerners, two of the invaders ultimately made their homes in the coastal region of Palestine between Gaza and Mount Carmel. Egyptian aspirations of Syro-Palestinian hegemony were put to an end by the attempted invasion. For a very long time, several theories, a lack of facts, and uncertainty have spread mystery and muddled the truth behind his passing away. Pharaohs of the New Kingdom who came before Ramses III had been having trouble with both internal and external obstacles up until Ramses III took power. As a result, Ramses III inherited an unstable country that was full of problems that had not been resolved. It was of the utmost significance that Usurmatra Meriomun Ramses III, son of Santantke and second pharaoh of the 20th dynasty, was crowned king. The transition to a new ruler would mark the beginning of a new era, one that would bring about new possibilities for the pharaoh and the people of Egypt, making preparations absolutely necessary. This day had finally arrived after many months of toiling away, making plans, and making preparations. The next pharaoh, Ramses III, named after Ramses II the Great, was scheduled to be crowned in Medinet Abu on March 26, 1186 BC, amid the grandest of ceremonies. The new pharaoh had a strong physique, was in good health, exuded charisma, was extremely well organized and shrewd, and was a brilliant and exceptionally capable military leader. An inscription in Medinet Abu, where the coronation took place, describes a symbolic ceremony in which four doves were released to the four corners of the empire's horizons to announce Ramses III's accession to the throne and his eventual triumph in maintaining order and cosmos in Egyptian society and beyond. The extraordinary celebrations lasted for days and featured lavish cuisines, music, and entertainment, but once they concluded, Ramses got down to business. Although Ramses was an exceptional leader, growing discontent with the empire's internal concerns eventually led to his downfall. His defense had been successful, but the battle had drained Egypt's resources and hampered the economy. People were starving, and it led to the first strike in recorded history. Although the war certainly contributed, they cannot take all the blame. Unfortunately for Ramses, agriculture was halted for 20 years due to a lack of sunshine that may have been caused by a volcanic explosion. The labor strike was a setback, but the breakdown of Egyptian society was the primary reason for the country's overall collapse. Ramses had to mediate conflicts between governors and officials, as well as tensions between upper and lower regions of Egypt. The prominent priests had grown too powerful and were seizing control of the government, and he was attempting to rein them in. He was already very busy. Ramses was a great king and military leader, but a terrible family man, as we've already established. He was a clever man, but he had two significant flaws, a desire for wealth and a profound attraction to women. His fatal flaw was indecision, which led to him having two queens instead of only one. During the 5,000 years that the pharaohs ruled Egypt, this had never happened. The size of his harem, which included several wives, was not an issue. Huge harems were common for pharaohs. His indecision encouraged competition and rivalry among the women. 
Ramses went gently by the blue lotus pool in the yard of his palace of a million years, greeted by a fresh, warm lotus-scented air that reminded him that spring had finally arrived. His house in Thebes was exquisitely furnished and protected by walls that were 10 meters thick, but he knew from personal experience that the real danger lay within. His relatives would eventually be the ones to kill him. Several assassination attempts on his life were unsuccessful. He suspected that the widespread use of magic in the harem was to blame for his indecision and perplexity. Sometimes voodoo dolls were used in conjunction with black magic to perform spells and cause harm. The carpet viper, a venomous snake, was found under his bed a few years back, and it wasn't the first or last time anything unusual had happened to him. About six months prior, the royal physician saved his life by administering an antidote when his favorite dish was poisoned. His mind was hazy, he was weak and uncertain about who was behind the attacks, but he wasn't a simple victim to eliminate. His royal guards had been working tirelessly day and night to uncover the mission's true nature, and he had no doubt they would soon succeed. With the added protection, he felt confident that they might be able to catch that black shadow lurking within the palace, and he looked forward to the forthcoming lavish celebrations, all with their fine dishes and dancers performing beneath the full moon. The women in Ramses' harem were up to no good as he sat in the garden next to the Blue Lotus Pond. They were deep, hatching their plot to take his life. Both the harem and the two official wives were divided into two factions. There was Iset, or Isis, and her son, Ramses IV, while on the opposite side was Tia and her son, Pentawaret. The dispute centered on who would have their son succeed Ramses III, who was then 65 years old. All of these battles and turmoil had taken a toll on the country, and it was Ramses III's predecessors who had the most difficulty dealing with several wars and instability at the boundaries of the empire. But Ramses had no intention of giving up and disappearing into oblivion, at least not quite yet. He was certain that Egypt had not seen its zenith yet, and would experience more triumphs in the future. The first thing Ramses wanted to do was bring unity to the country, and he was tremendously successful in this endeavor. In the fifth year of his reign, the country was united and the army was restored. However, he was then confronted with intense attacks from the west. The Libyans were making their way toward Egypt, but Ramses III was, as was to be expected, well prepared. They were quickly destroyed by an Egyptian army that was well organized and well trained. His reputation as an effective military commander was enhanced by the many feats that he had previously accomplished. Soon after, Ramses was forced to do battle with the Sea People, who were responsible for the demise of a great number of other civilizations and empires prior to their meeting with Ramses III. The Sea People were actually a form of an alliance of forces hailing from the northern Mediterranean, including the Achaeans. They sailed their fleets up to Egypt and made their approach. Despite this, they were routed by the Egyptian fleet even before they set foot on the ground on the Egyptian side. In the future, Ramses would not only leave us a written narrative of his wars with the Sea People, but he would also leave a comprehensive drawing of it in the mortuary temple he had built for himself. He had become known all across Egypt as a war pharaoh and a result of his effective military methods, and this recognition spread throughout the country. What happens next is a historical event called the Harem Conspiracy. We know with a high degree of accuracy what happened during the celebrations at Madinat Tabu that fateful night, as well as who was involved in the conspiracy, thanks to the discovery of a papyrus trial manuscript dating back to Ramses III. T.A. and Punta Waret were the principal conspirators, but there were others involved as well. Ramses, tired of the parting beneath the bright moonlight, went back to his chambers to spend some quiet time alone. As usual, his guards halted and waited by the harem's entrance. Inside, he and his wives carried on with their drinking and talking. Someone in the shadows sprang out of nowhere and slashed Ramses' throat open all the way to the spine. Suddenly tiring from the ordeal, he dropped the massive blade on the pharaoh's left toe, severing it cleanly and vanished without a trace. Ramses III's life was cut short by an assassin. On April 15, 1155 BC, at the age of 65, he passed away. The actual court proceeding was broken up into three distinct portions. A total of 12 judges were selected, and a number of scribes were employed to record the proceedings. It was discovered that T.A. and Pentawaret were the two most influential members of the conspiracy. Even Ramses' chief of the chamber, Pebek Kamen, was complicit in the affair, as were a number of royal butlers, a pantry chef, Bakamana, two treasury overseers, two snake charmers, two royal scribes, two military officials, one policeman, and many royal guards. According to the transcripts of the remaining trials, a total of 38 individuals were found guilty and condemned to death. All of the conspirators were executed, but the more prominent ones were given the opportunity to end their lives by poisoning themselves instead, as this was regarded as a more respectful choice than being put to death. 
This point marked the termination of respect. Because their identities and presence were erased from everything in Egypt, TA and Pensilverettes were not only perished, but even more tragically, they were denied the opportunity to proceed to the afterlife. This was far worse than losing their lives. They did an excellent job of erasing their identities. The only evidence that remained to show their existence was the paperwork from their trials and the empty tombs where they were buried. Ramses wasn't totally unaware of what was going on in the room with him and those around him. Toward the end of his life, he penned a will in the great Hams Papyrus in which he beseeched Amun to grant the throne to his son, Ramses IV. This will was found after his death. When you consider the number of times that Ramses used this statement, you can deduce that it must have been something that was very dear to his heart and personally significant to him on a moral level. That's all we have for the video today, but we'll be right back with more videos soon. Please don't forget to give this one a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel, and thanks for watching.